take my own time here so I make sure that I'm sticking to the schedule. Very good. Very good. Well, I want to I, I want to thank uh, Charlie Cray in, in particular for inviting me to participate and uh, Mr. Nader for allowing me to participate and uh, Robert Weissman for occasionally publishing my scribblings in his uh, otherwise fine multinational uh, monitor magazine. And I want to thank all of you, thank all of you very sincerely. Uh, I know there's sometimes uh, optimism is, is not considered fashionable, but I think the fact is that uh, I and my family are safer because of you and your efforts. Uh, the air I breathe is a little bit cleaner than it otherwise would be. The food that I eat is a little bit safer. The water I drink, the cars I drive are a little bit safer. So it's not a perfect world, but uh, you've made an incredible difference in the lives of many people, most notably my own. So I thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> I really want to focus on the, the reclamation of antitrust rather than the resuscitation of it because I think uh, reclaiming it is what is... Uh, absolutely uh, critical to everything else. And uh, my message is very straightforwardly that uh, to reclaim antitrust, we must reclaim the language that is utilized in and around uh, antitrust. Language is everything, as I think most of you appreciate. It's been said many different ways that uh, words are ideas, words are meaning, language is, is very important. I think uh, what uh, Mr. Nader was saying in his kickoff uh, comments this morning were a perfect uh, illustration of that. So what I'd like to throw out for you in the time I've got <clears throat> is this reclamation to reclaim not just antitrust but the language of economics, which is very, very important, to reclaim the language of the American tradition, which is very, very important in antitrust, and I'm even going to suggest to reclaim a little bit of the language of uh, genuine conservatism as opposed to the uh, bizarre brand that seems to be fashionable uh, today. Uh, an earlier uh, commenter on a panel kept uh, talking about the dead hand of the past. And what I'm suggesting is uh, maybe turning that dead hand into the live hand of the future. Uh, we've had 30 years of what I think is... Uh, taxidermy being practiced on American antitrust. It has been drained of meaning, vitality, and life, and stuffed with sawdust instead, so that uh, it appears the same, but uh, the appearance is all there is, and I don't need to, to lead you through all of that. I think uh, this is typified for me in a, in a uh, comment that uh, Justice Thomas wrote in a decision this year that found that the two biggest oil companies in the world uh, are able to get together and agree on the price they'll charge on gasoline. And he wrote, quote, it's price fixing, but it's not price fixing in an antitrust sense. <laughs> and I've thought about that many times, and what I'm suggesting here today is that perhaps it's the antitrust sense that needs to be reconsidered if that's not a problem. Sense in a couple of different ways, like common sense. Um, so let me, let me throw out some ideas here. Uh, first, I think it's uh, critically important to reclaim the language of economics, which, as Mr. Nader pointed out, has been used and abused to promote a particular point of view. Economics is actually not so unidimensional or narrow. Economics is actually quite powerful and broad. And let me give you a couple of examples. For one, a lot of antitrust has been gutted in recent years in the name of consumer welfare and maximizing consumer welfare. But that version of consumer welfare is a one-dimensional stick figure of the notion of welfare, and it basically all focuses on whether a widget costs a nickel more or a nickel less. That's the sum total of the well-being of consumers. The economic power structure, the concentration of sales is all considered irrelevant. But the, the economic concept of, of uh, consumer welfare is far, far broader than that. In fact, you can trace it back 200 years ago to, to the whole founder of what became this, this part of economics, Jeremy Bentham, uh, 
where he talked about the idea of utility and well-being as being pleasure and good and happiness and benefit. And that has nothing to do with whether widgets are a nickel more or a nickel less. It's much broader than that. And he also talked about bads. There weren't just goods, they're also bads. And once you think about the concentration of power and the concentration of industries in a few large firms, you think about that as bad and as detracting from consumer well-being and welfare, then that puts antitrust in a very, very different uh, light. And all of a sudden, mega-mergers and monopoly and oligopoly industries dominated by a few large firms uh, are something that matter. And in fact, they matter a great deal in terms of detracting from consumer uh, welfare. Uh, I can't resist pointing out that one of, the, one of the famous people of the Chicago School, Gary Becker, uh, was awarded a Nobel Prize primarily on the grounds of arguing that welfare should be defined broadly, not narrowly, in terms of analyzing issues like racial discrimination in the family and crime. There it is right there. There it is right there. Another holy grail of the anti-antitrust movement of the past 30 years is efficiency. Efficiency. The be-all and end-all. And yet no one asks, efficient at doing what? I'm reminded of something someone once said, asked me. Which is more efficient, an interstate highway or an old backcountry road? The answer is, depends on where you're going. If the interstate doesn't go where you're going, it's not an efficient choice. Now you think about efficiency in a much broader way. And I teach this with my students to try to get them to think about it. I kind of jump a little bit into the political sphere. Economists are always poaching on everyone else's territory. Uh, think about our constitutional system of, uh, of uh, checks and balances. And I ask the students, is that an efficient form of government? And they say, well, no, it acts really slowly. And you say, but maybe quick-acting government is not the goal that you're after. <laughs> I believe Iraq is a case in point of quick action not necessarily being right action or good action or wise action. No, if the goal of a governance structure is to try to hold back and minimize the abuse of government power, then a system of checks and balances and separation of powers is extraordinarily efficient at its objective, at its goal, at its purpose. Now we come back to economics and we say, you know, a competitive marketplace with numerous competing rivals is also a system of economic checks and balances. It is a separation of economic decision-making power into the hands of numerous firms rather than one or a few, in which they each act as a check and balance on the other to guard against or at least minimize the abuse of economic decision-making uh, power. To give those terms to the other side is to give away the battle. So you need to think about reclaiming those because they're very powerful terms. To give them away is like giving away the fight. I think of my own time as a younger person when I had more hair. It's, uh, it's a little bit like the mistake that was made in the Vietnam years by burning the American flag. You gave the other side the win. Instead, you wear the American flag and say this is not the American way. You don't give that symbol up, I don't think. Okay, second point. Reclaim the language of antitrust. This may come as a surprise. <clears throat> it's a part that uh, people seem to want to forget. I'm at a little university, Miami University, which is in Ohio. We like to say that uh, Miami was a university before Florida was a state, which is true. Uh, <clears throat> There was a Republican senator from the state of Ohio, a rock-ribbed Republican senator from the state of Ohio by the name of John Sherman. And, of course, he was the one who eventually uh, pushed to enact the Sherman antitrust law. And this is how he made the case for it on the floor of the Senate in the late 1800s, a fairly conservative age. And he put it this way. 
He said, if we will not endure a king as a political power, we should not endure a king over the production and sale of the necessities of economic life. If we would not submit to an emperor, we should not submit to an autocrat of trade with the power to prevent competition and fix the price of any commodity. There's the language of antitrust in the United States. It's rooted squarely in the American tradition, the American tradition of a suspicion of those with power and of the necessity to impose structural restraints and constraints on their exercise of that power. As uh, Thomas Jefferson said, good government is affected by a dispersion of powers, not their concentration. And the same is true for a good economy, an efficient economy, and an innovative economy. And I also should say, this is not because business people are singularly evil and depraved. It's because all of us are singularly evil and depraved. You can call it the duality of human nature. You can call it the stain of original sin. There's a little bit of depravity in all of us, and thus the necessity to check that kind of power. The unchecked economic, uh, the, power, the problems of unchecked economic power, I think, are familiar, and they go beyond a nickel more per widget. Uh, and in fact, they may be five or six thousand dollars more per pill, as Dr. Wolf has pointed out in many, many times. They go beyond that to the capacity of the major oil companies here lately to hold the entire country hostage by saying either abandon the search for alternative fuels or we will not expand our refinery operations and you'll have four and five and six dollar gasoline uh, forever. And the ultimate abuse of that power, of course, is when uh, the government bails out a failing large corporation, which is a complete perversion of the principles of private enterprise. Now, reclaim a little bit of the language, the important language of, of economics, reclaim uh, the language of American antitrust. And, and speaking of Sherman, I would suggest you might want to think about reclaiming the language of genuine uh, conservatism. It's a more powerful ally than I think you may have thought. And I'll give you just a couple of examples uh, of that. One of them comes from none other than the founding father of economics, Adam Smith, who, if you read his Wealth of Nations, is a tract against excessive economic power and its complete corruption of government. Uh, but he has a number of choice passages. One of them was this, looking at England of his time, the late 1700s, well, early 1700s. He said, the cruelest of our tax laws are mild and gentle compared to the laws which the clamor of our manufacturers has extorted from the legislature, his term, for the support of their own absurd and oppressive monopolies. That's Adam, Adam Smith. Interesting, I think. Another interesting person that bears another look is uh, a fellow named uh, Henry Simons, who was at the University of Chicago back in the uh, 1920s, 30s, and and 40s. And in a wonderful book of his, he categorically declared, by the way, his, 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 his conservative credentials were unquestioned. But conservatives, I think, were smarter then. Uh, <clears throat> he categorically stated, and I quote from Simon, the great enemy of democracy is monopoly in all its forms. And he went on to say, there's no reasonable excuse to tolerate disproportionately large companies and corporations. He said, quote, even if their much claimed economies of size were real, sound policy would sacrifice these economies to preserving more economic freedom and equality. That's very interesting. You can even find it in a person like Hayek, who is considered to be the father of libertarianism. And yet even Hayek, in the road to serfdom, thought that monopolies were one of the two most serious threats to a free society. I'll leave it to your imagination who the second one was. And uh, he advocated, he suggested that we should have a law that limits corporate size uh, and limits the indefinite growth of corporate size. Now that's from conservatives. They understood something very important. 
There's an old saying, a hundred years ago it used to be said that the, that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, tariff is the mother of the trust, meaning that if you block free trade, you would create domestic monopolies. I think these conservatives understood that the reverse was true as well, that the trust is the mother of the tariff, and that economic power inevitably and unavoidably is political power and influence. And you either limit the economic power or you have to create a more dictatorial system of governance, which is what they thought was, was far more uh, disturbing. Today's conservatives who have a kind of hands-off, laissez-faire approach, uh, mergers are good, otherwise they wouldn't happen. The more of them, the better. The bigger they are, the better. Uh, they celebrate that sort of thing. To me, they are like Henry David Thoreau's neighbors, about whom he said, they prayed and prayed about the devil, but they invite him in at every chance. The older conservatives understood that. Uh, I'll end with this, because this is, I like this too. This goes back to a very respectable economist writing in the 1920s, and he, he compared the problem of corporate size. He used the analogy of what he called a common house cat, and I love this because it has all the flowery language of almost a century ago. He said, imagine our common house cat, whose small size makes her a safe inmate of our household. If, in spite of her playful disposition, without the slightest change of character, she were suddenly enlarged to the dimensions of a tiger, we should at least want her muzzled and have her claws trimmed. Whereas if she were to assume the dimensions of a mastodon, I doubt if any of us would want to live in the same house with her. And it would be unpersuasive, he said, to argue, and I'm quoting, that her nature had not changed, that she was just as amiable as ever, no more carnivorous than she had ever been. Nor would it convince us to be told that her productivity had increased and that she, and that she could now catch more, more mice in a minute than she formerly could in a week. I love this. We should be afraid lest, in a playful mood, she might set a paw upon us to the detriment of our epidermis or that in her large-scale mouse catching, she might not always distinguish between us and the mice. Thank you very much.